Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of this fantastic seminar and listen to those really heavyweight discussions. It's been a pleasure. Um, I have to say that I am not a scholar, so my talk today will be slightly, maybe even quiet off. I'm a practitioner, and I'm here unfortunately alone with my partner in crime, who is Pavlo Makov, the artist who wasn't, wasn't granted the visa to Canada on time. So I'm doing this talk for both of us and telling our mutual story. Um, so to start with, I have to give a little bit of context on who we are. I'm an art curator, and um, I'm a co-owner of a, the gallery in Kiev called The Naked Room which was founded by me and my partners in late 2018, so we are almost four years old. And we founded it with an ambition to promote and support up-and-coming and emerging artists in Ukraine. Um, saying that, I don't mean that uh, they're kind of new or young or fresh. They're the artists with kind of profound practice, but still underrepresented um, both nationally and internationally. And our ambition was to build a reasonable art market for those positions. But on top of that, we also work with a number of quite established positions in Ukrainian art scene, artists like Pavlo Makov himself, but also uh, Viktor Marushenko, Alexander Chikminov, um, Alejo Osi, so sometimes artists, sometimes their families or artist estates. And th with those artists, we uh, have a kind of a different approach to their work. We don't just show kind of new projects in the gallery as we do with the younger ones, but we look into their archives in the history of what they have been doing in the past 30, 40 years. And with that, we, would lo we always uh, aimed at establishing, you know, lines of you know history you know looking at how the works that were created in the late 80s or early 90s are still relevant and can be relevant uh, in today and that was the case with um, pablo makov actually uh, with whom we applied two years or even three years ago for the national competition to represent Ukraine at Venice Biennale. Well, if you know Venice Biennale is like the Olympic Games in the arts, though it's not a competition, but still. And we won it. Um, and uh, we applied there with this piece. It's called Fountain of Exhaustion. Well, I was happy to hear this word many times today. So it, I guess it has some relevance. And it's an old work from 1994. And um, uh, as you can see, well, those are images actually from 1994, the first model in paper, and then uh, quite a later one in uh, tin uh, installed on the, uh, on the city wall. And uh, it is a construction, well, basically uh, a system of um, uh, funnels. Each of them has uh, one mouse and two noses. And in the next row, we add another one. Uh, so it's kind of a triangular structure. And if you put water in the first one, it kind of splits in two, and then in four, and then in six. And in the end, well, there was an idea that it evaporates completely, like exhausting itself. There was a specific kind of context in which this piece was created, and it was Pavlo's native city of Kharkiv, um, uh, the post-Soviet Kharkiv, you know, the mid-90s Kharkiv, and there are some two documentary uh, testimonies of that time. You know, one is um, actually an announcement on the uh, on the door of his of his house that there is no water for the upcoming three days, and that disruption with water supply was actually caused by a, gra a great accident in the mm, pumping station, and the whole city was kind of flooded. You know, people would use boats actually to move in the city, and that was kind of a paradox. You know, the city is full of water, but there is no running water in the taps. But disruptions of water were not, well, were quite, uh, yeah, there in many, in many towns and cities in Ukraine, not just caused by the accidents, but just by the collapse of the infrastructure. Uh, like the fountains, uh, which Kharkiv is full of, weren't working, you know, they, were fu they weren't functioning for several years. And watching that kind of deteriorating landscape, but also watching, you know, the society, as Marco would say always, uh, that uh, was losing energy and wasn't actually able to perform under that circumstances. Um, he came up with this kind of paradoxical idea of a fountain that is not, you know, in abundance. It's a fountain that uh, is some quite contrary to the fountain idea. It exhausts itself in the end. And um, 
Uh, he he actually uh, yeah he conceived this work conceptually. He also made the funnels you know of different materials throughout the years. But it was always, you know, more of a concept of a fountain than a really working thing. It was just, you know, a sculpture. And um, when we discussed, uh, you know, the project that we'd, we could uh, apply for the national competition, we came up with this idea uh, that um, the fountain that could be reconstructed as a working thing, you know, in 2019, 20, uh, could have a much um, bigger relevance in contemporary world because uh, the thing that was very local at that time, you know, the exhaustion of, you know, post-Soviet society is now kind of applicable in Markov's view, and we supported that to the kind of democratic world, yeah, to, and um, we can speak of exhaustion of uh, resources, we can speak of exhaustion of politics, yeah, we can speak of uh, exhaustion of humanity even. And with that idea, we... Um, uh, applied for it, so this is a model actually, architectural, not a real one, uh, because we had certain, um, yeah, originally it was meant to be mounted like right on the wall, you know, of a building or somewhere in the street, but because we had a pavilion in Venice, which is a kind of architectural heritage and you can't touch anything there, you know, you can't drill, so we had to come up with, uh, you know, an autonomous structure and our friends from Architectural Bureau Forma, well, made this um, design basically for the working fountain that had a pump inside and the water going down. Uh, for us, it was another context also important as curators, um, you know, producing a work that, you know, was supposed to be produced like 30 years ago, but wasn't for a number of reasons, is something very exemplary of how we see, you know, the recent history of Ukrainian art, because it's not just the history of what was done and what happened, but also the history of what wasn't done and what hasn't happened. And this was kind of a restoration of, you know, historical justice to us. So, um, yeah, this is our small team, three co-curators, Boris, Lizaveta, myself, and Pavlo. Um, in, um, January 17, 2022, one of the last public events we had uh, in our gallery before the invasion, when we uh, introduced uh, the architectural model and also the concept of the whole pavilion to local Ukrainian audiences. And then we have uh, February 20, 24th, um, which is the last uh, kind of uh, uh, day in this old calendar that uh, we all used. And here is, you know, <laughs> for, Uk for many Ukrainians, it's kind of the end of uh, traditional history or in even the end of end of history, I would rather say. And we started a new calendar at that day. So now we count the days of the war. So day one. Um, basically, by that time, uh, the fountain was fully produced uh, in both parts. One of the parts are actually funnels made of bronze. You can see them there in the box. And the other part was this technical kind of big uh, structure of iron uh, that weighed like 500 kilos. Yeah, and it was, it was independently produced by uh, another company. And uh, obviously, you know, all transportation was disrupted and that was very clear. I can't say that we were kind of completely unprepared for the invasion. We were pretty much sure that it's going to happen, especially after kind of several talks, public you know, talks by Putin, you know, denying Ukraine as a country. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a joke among our team that if that happens, you know, like I had my car with full tank and I was kind of mobile, the most mobile person from our team. And then, uh, yeah, I was joking that, you know, in any, you know, in the worst case scenario, I just take the funnels, the three boxes, put them in my car and I will try to get them to Venice and we'll see what we can do after that. Because we couldn't allow... Russia to, you know, <laughs> because it was their goal, you know, one of the goals of this war is to disrupt Ukrainian culture and we couldn't allow them to do that. So, uh, like on the end of the first day of the war, um, 
Uh, yeah, it was kind of clear that the situation is getting worse and worse, but there was a short window when, you know, the first champs were kind of a little bit lighter. And also it felt that, you know, the shelling was not as heavy as in the morning. <laughs> I later learned that people who live in the heavy shelled areas, they learn it very quickly, like when you can go out and when there are certain kind of pauses in that. And feeling that, I just packed in five minutes, you know, took the three boxes in my car and started on a journey towards EU-Ukrainian border. Uh, meanwhile, I'll tell a couple of, yeah, there are some images that I were getting from my team on my way. This is Boris Filonenko, who was at the time in in the west of the country, you know, just traveling with his girlfriend when it broke out and his family was staying in Kharkiv. Uh, he's from Kharkiv himself too. So he was trying to organize, you know, their evacuation and some humanitarian aid from very, very long distance. And the second image was sent to me actually by Pavlo Makov who was staying in Kharkiv at the time. And this was just taken 100 meters outside of his home, you know, this missile that didn't blow, which was a common <laughs> in the very beginning. These are two photographs made by Lisa German, my gallery partner and a good friend. And she was 90, 39 weeks pregnant at the time. So she kind of decided to stay at home in her dear apartment next to her parents. You know, her uh, clinic was still operating in these days. And uh, yeah, uh, her apartment is kind of small, but one of the walls is just windows so it's like fully <laughs> it's like and uh, yeah so she started like on day three to cover everything you know with blankets <laughs> and you know devices that she had in home of course now we know that it's not just the blankets but even the second wall doesn't always you know save you from uh, from a direct attack but still kind of a psychological defense it uh, worked at the time and this is Pablo himself uh, with his wife um, uh, Marina Hushenko, and uh, they were privileged enough to stay, I think, at what, at, in what was perhaps the best uh, bomb shelter in the whole Ukraine. Uh, it, it is an official bomb shelter of Kharkiv University, uh, but for the last 10 years it has also been an art center, Yermila Art Center, and it had lights, it had water, it had uh, heating and even art on the walls, so it was kind of close to the conditions <laughs> he normally lived in. And he, uh, he he couldn't leave actually uh, because well I I needed him you know to believe in you know towards Venice too because I didn't want to do that alone but he wouldn't leave because of his mother who was uh, who is 92 and yeah she was like very you know arrogant like uh, people you know who survived the Second World War can be she said like well I, I went through it you know I can do another one. But then, uh, you know, days six and seven were really heavy in Kharkiv. On day six, uh, you know, uh, the ODA, uh, the um, uh, regional administration, which is just opposite the Kharkiv University, it's just like 200 meters, or maybe less, like 100 meters away. And when that uh, missile strike it, you know, Pavlo said that, you know, the earth was shattering, you know, despite him being in a very, very, very safe bomb shelter. So it was like, uh, for him, the first um, point to kind of be proactive in trying to evacuate his family. And uh, this is the building of, um, yeah, SBU, the special services in Kharkiv, uh, which is just next to his mother's house. So when that uh, hit, uh, that when that was hit, uh, like the mother herself said, okay, yeah, I can go. And that was day seven when they started on their journey from Kharkiv. And I was already at the border, which is uh, the second photo. So actually it took me four days, not, not seven, uh, to get uh, from um, Kiev to Transcarpathia region to the border there. I just stayed for three nights, you know, trying to, yeah, <laughs> revive a little bit. And, but yeah, and for Makiv, you know, he took like almost 10 days to get to the border because uh, the, the roads were very, very, very slow. And I could do only like 200 kilometers per day despite driving for 10 hours. Um, well, and now we are kind of back to Kiev because not everybody left, uh, you know, uh, part of our colleagues who stayed um, and also ourselves at the time we were getting a lot of 
um, letters of support and also proposals for help. And uh, people wanted to donate somewhere, you know, to help the artist. And that's when we realized that we have to fund a legal body in order to be able to operate, you know, with, uh, within that support. And we founded Ukrainian Emergency Art Fund that supports artists affected by war. And in this first months of the war, um, uh, the support was... Um, um, was given, you know, to those who, uh, to the needs of survival mostly, to the artists, you know, who had to move away from their homes uh, or were staying in occupation. Uh, but today it's more supporting um, the work and the development and also representation. Um, uh, saying that, well, we left uh, something very important also behind because I could only take three boxes of funnels but I couldn't take the two storages of art from the gallery which is kind of a private entity but still we kind of we can serve some works that are actually national heritage like the pieces by Ole Hoosi who passed away in 1994 and we own kind of the last public uh, paintings in in the whole country and um, yeah, our storage was packed because yeah, we were, as I said, we were expecting and we were planning an evacuation, but the bus was actually scheduled for February 24, so we were kind of one day late. And then we were looking for opportunities to still be able to evacuate the pieces and we were looking at everywhere, like our collectors, sponsors, I don't know, like commercial transport. And in the end, you know, we faced the reality that it's not about, you know, there, is, there was even commercial transport but that we're ready to take something out from Kiev. But the reality was that, uh, you know, our, the artworks couldn't be moved legally, you know, because the blog posts, you know, would check every car and, you know, you needed to have permission from both the Ministry of Culture, which, which was our partner, but was unavailable, and also the Kiev City Council, which was, again, ungettable. And, uh, but luckily, you know, we have this horizontal kind of connections in Ukraine, and these are two people who actually saved our collection. One of them is Leonid Moroshak. He's um, a curator and activist, and he, oh, from the first day, he was volunteering a lot. And he was bringing, actually, humanitarian aid from western parts of the country to Kiev and further to Kharkiv. And he kind of n knew his way with the blog post and people policing that. So what he did, he actually suggested that he kind of smuggles it in several, you know, takes. And then we also needed a place to store the works and um, uh, like public, mu and we needed it to be safe. So we needed kind of a public museum, you know, that would conserve the pieces and not just some room, you know, elsewhere. And public museums, again, according to, you know, their statute, they couldn't accept anything that is not from public collections. And uh, thanks to Olga Konchar, who is um, the director of, uh, that's a favorite museum, it's called the Museum of yeah. Terror. Yeah, she kind of found a way to uh, take it through with, uh, you know, with her superiors, and she accepted uh, this whole collection, and it is still stored at the um, Museum of Terror. Okay, I'll skip that. And then the, the kind of the story is rounding up. I reached um, Italy on day 19. By the time we got so much support from the Biennale itself and also many, many international partners, and we were able to contract actually the um, Italian company to rebuild this whole kind of iron structure and you. And day 21, I reached Venice with the Fanos. Ah, and yeah, this is perhaps the happiest day of this first kind of several months. Uh, Lisa gave it, given a birth to her baby boy on day 22. And uh, actually, if I could give one advice on how to survive the war in the best manner, you, you have to have a baby, you know, because it's kind of, she was the happiest of all of us, you know, despite what was going on around, the hormones were pumping up. So think about that. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, when Pablo joined me uh, in Venice, and since then we kind of stopped being, you know, a curator and an artist. We became speakers, ambassadors for the whole of Ukraine because uh, Venice Biennale is, have, is uh, very well covered. You know, we talk to every media, I think, in the world. Now, people still recognize me in the street, I have to say, because, yeah, somehow I was the speaker of that story. 
And uh, yeah, on day 56, you know, the whole actually team of the pavilion was able to reach Venice, which was unthinkable in the first several days. Yes, uh, I'm finishing it. Just, um, um, okay, uh, just to finish it. Um, uh, we wanted, uh, um, after this Venice journey, we also wanted to bring the fountain to Ukraine, you know, to uh, pay tribute to this country of origin. Well, Kharkiv would be an ideal place to do it. It's still undoable. But then we got a proposal from the museum of uh, Bogdan and Varvara Hanenko. And they have an uh, interesting link with the Venice Biennale because the current Russian pavilion used by Russia, it was built uh, with the money of Bogdan Hanyanka and on his uh, kind of call towards uh, the Tsar. Uh, so now a museum is empty, as all public museums in Ukraine, collections are down, and working with contemporary art is the only way for them to actually go through. So they suggested that we have the fountain there in December, which we were planning to do. This was the day when we applied for additional funding, and uh, they, the 129, just last Monday, I think. Yeah, so this is uh, like the, my, the crossroads of my heart. You know, on the left, you see my alma mater, the Institute of Philology. Uh, then in front, there is the Taras Shevchenko Park, which is where I walk my dog, and just right behind it, there is another pit out of uh, out of the second missile that uh, exploded just outside of the uh, museum of uh, Bogdan and Varvara Hanenki. It's not completely destroyed, but it's kind of heavily injured, you know, the glass uh, ceiling went down, you know, all the uh, windows are shattered, and now everything is kind of on hold. Thank you so much. I'm sorry it took longer. <laughs>